Life Audio. Faith Over Fear is brought to you by Life Audio and is part of our Faith Toolkit series. For more inspirational, faith-affirming podcasts, visit us at lifeaudio.com. Welcome to the Faith Over Fear podcast, where we discuss powerful truths to help us fight anxieties and fears, big and small. At Holy Love Ministries, we are passionate about helping God's children discover, embrace, and experience soul-deep emotional and spiritual freedom, and then to inspire them to share that freedom with others. We would love to connect with you. Just visit our show notes to learn about one of our upcoming events, how to book one of our speakers for your next event, or simply to connect with us online. Hey, Harker Heights, there's a new 7-Eleven in town. Now open at 307 East FM 2410 Road. Find all your favorites like Big Bite Hot Dogs, Pizza, Taquitos, Big Gulps, and Slurpees. Everything you need to get back on the go. Check out what's new with coffee from 7-Eleven. And be sure to grab one of our delicious fresh bakery items like a cookie or muffin. Visit the new 7-Eleven now open at 307 East FM 2410 Road. And download the 7 Rewards app to score free food and drinks. Do you sometimes doubt if you're truly hearing God's voice or if it's really your own? Or have you been in a season where it feels like He has been completely silent? Have you been praying for a way to learn how to hear His voice more clearly? Hey friends, I'm Rachel, host of the Hearing Jesus podcast. If you are ready to grow in your faith and to confidently step into your identity in Christ, then join me as we dig deep into God's Word so you can learn to live out your faith in your everyday life. To listen now, go to lifeaudio.com or search Hearing Jesus on your favorite podcast app. I'm Jennifer Slattery, and if you've listened to many Faith Over Fear episodes, you've probably heard us talk about living in the victory of Christ, of processing our emotions and our struggles with Him, and actively, intentionally, and progressively advancing towards increased freedom, emotional and spiritual freedom. And I suspect those words resonate with the deepest places within you because God created us to experience joy, peace, and freedom. But while this is always, always, always his heart for us, I have found that those soul states rarely come without a fight. And for some of you, your biggest fight, and at times your most painful and self-defeating battles, center around food. If that's true for you, I know you'll benefit from today's conversation. But I also want to encourage those of you who don't struggle with emotional eating to listen because the insights my guest is about to share have value for every unhealthy coping mechanism you and I have learned to engage in. We can all benefit from the wisdom today's guest, Barb Raveling, has to offer. Barb, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Barb is a podcaster and the author of seven books and Bible studies in the area of personal growth. Her top ranked podcast, Taste for Truth, and the Christian Habits podcast have earned over a million downloads and continue to inspire people to break free from their strongholds and grow closer to God. Barb writes from her own experience. She's been consistently renewing her mind for life change since 2000. And we'll talk about that. I think that's a very important little piece for people to hear. So 23 years you've been on that journey. And her ed- long time. Yes. And her education as an executive Christian coach certified through Coach Approach Ministries. You can connect with Barb at barbraveling.com. And I've invited her on to discuss her book titled Say Goodbye to Emotional Eating, 100 Renewing Exercises to Help You Break Free from the Control of Food. And so in it, she provides 100 exercises based on biblical teaching that will change how you see food, dieting, and weight loss. As you read, you'll grow closer to God as you honestly and humbly present your struggles to him. And I got to pause, Barb. I love that, that in this battle and turning something that maybe was a big weight and a burden into an opportunity for intimacy with him. And I love how your book provides that. She also helps you build boundaries to stop you from using food as a coping mechanism to make emergency plans for when you're tempted to overindulge, find freedom from strongholds by focusing your mind on God's desires for your heart and so much more. And and this is from her back cover. She said, when you trade the lies that lead you to overeat for the truths that set you free, you'll find yourself craving closeness with God above all else. Say goodbye to emotional eating will help you build effective strategies for maintaining a spiritually satisfying relationship with food. And again, I just want to add as the insights that you provide 
really are beneficial, whether you're struggling with alcoholism or or addicted to social media or whether you shut down, like however unhealthy ways that we cope with with our unmanaged emotions. I really think your your insights are very helpful. And you you begin your book sharing your struggle with emotional eating. So you come from a place of vulnerability and really you struggle with that back even in college, correct? Yeah, I struggled with it for about 25 years, probably. It started in high school, in college. I do the binge eating, the the waking up the next morning, regretting it. And I really thought it was that one thing that I'd never get over because, uh, you know, I did it for so many years and I didn't have the self-control to follow an eating plan, no matter how many times I tried. Well, on page 11, I'm going to quote you. For me, eating was the one thing in life that controlled me the thing I thought I'd never get over. And I hear, honestly, when I read that, I just sense so much pain in that. And what would you say to the listener who really relates to that is in that place of just feeling defeated and and stuck in these self-sabotaging cycles? I would tell you there is a way to get over it because I've been over it now for like probably 15 years. Wow. And yeah, so so you can break free. It's just that it's a different way to break free from my thought because I thought, if I could just find the perfect food plan or the perfect diet, or if I just had more self-control, or maybe I could just, you know, manage my life, learn how to not procrastinate, all these things, I thought that was the answer. And what I realized, no, what I, the answer is the renewing of the mind. The Bible says you're transformed by the renewing of the mind, which I'd heard years ago, but I didn't really know what it meant. I didn't know what it looked like on a practical level. So when I put all that effort into renewing my mind and changing the way I thought, rather than putting all the effort into dieting and exercise, I mean, it's not that I didn't still try and, you know, manage what I ate and exercise, but I I had to put all that work into changing the way I thought about both life and food. And that's when I started getting over it and, and did break free from the control of food and have been free now for for 15 years, no more yo-yo dieting. My weight hasn't changed and I'm living in that victory. So yeah, I tell you it's possible, but it does take some renewing the mind work. Wow. And that's really beautiful. And thinking of, so from my perspective, whether you are would consider yourself overweight or at your, your healthy weight, really it goes, it goes a lot deeper, right? Like it's how we view ourselves and how we cope with our emotions. And so how, at least that was my perspective, right? As I was reading the book. So How does emotional eating contribute to anxiety and really lead to perpetuating our anxiety? I mean, can that happen? Does that happen? Yeah, that, I think that's a really interesting question because I think it happens in a number of ways. Because in reality, when we emotionally eat, the anxiety disappears. So oh, while, we're, <laughs> yeah, yeah. while we're eating, we're like, oh, yay, everything's great. Everything's happy. We're not worried about anything. But then as soon as we're done eating, the anxiety comes back. So it, it doesn't do anything to change the situation we're anxious about. And it keeps us from working on that change. At least for me, that's what it did. So I, my, my tendency is to think about something, worry about it and not do anything to change it. But when I stopped emotionally eating and started going to God for help or renew my mind about it, it's like I was going to God for all those things in my life that were making me anxious. And I was working through those problems with God, changing in the ways that I needed to change and then doing the practical things I needed to do. And so I, not only did I grow in the area of breaking free from food, but also matured in the area of all these different situations that are causing my anxiety, my annoyance, for me to procrastinate, whatever it is. So I think it perpetuates it. We use it as an escape, but it it perpetuates it. And and also not only that, adds a new anxiety to our life because I don't know how many anxious moments I spent thinking about food, how much I weighed, how I look. So I think you also have to renew your mind about body image and be okay with your body as is and drop this idea that we have to be skinny and we have to look perfect and all those things that we kind of are told a lot of times indirectly through media. We have to get rid of those ideas as well. Yeah. So really, it's like so not dealing with what we should be dealing with. And then we're adding on just this sense of defeat and feeling out of control. And yeah, that's really painful in discussing the control eating can have in your life and and really your emotions fueling disordered eating, you wrote, and I'm going to quote you, instead of planning the life I want. So you're talking about when you were in that place, right? So instead of planning the life I want and following through with it, I'm allowing my emotion and desires to dictate my life. Now I got to tell you, I actually wrote that down on my desk because I th- it made me think not just with eating, what am I allowing to dictate my life instead of planning 
what I want. And I said, I want it where I can really, really see it. And I wonder, so talk to me, how does that play out just as you're fighting this battle? Maybe when you're kind of in the throes of it. Well, I call it living by desire rather than design. And what happens is we think that the good life is eating what we want when we want. So we think if we can just, you know, do what we really want to do, life's going to be great. But that only works if our desires are, you know, somewhat healthy. So for some people that works in the eating department, but for somebody like me who loves to eat, who eats for emotional reasons, who eats, you know, isn't opposed to huge quantities of food, it doesn't work. So I always want more than is good for me. And so it's better to, in a rational moment, say, okay, what, what do I want to eat? What do I want my boundaries to be? And my boundaries are three meals and one snack a day. And so then whatever I plan in that rational moment, I walk through and then I do that, even though I don't feel like it. So even if I feel like, having a snack, I don't because it's not unless it's in, within my boundaries. Of course, in the old days, I could say that and not follow through on it and have the self-control. So the renewing of the mind helps change the way I think so that I have the desire to follow my boundaries. So I really don't want to eat what I want when I want anymore and then have the self-control to follow them. I really like your emphasis on in your rational mind in, and saying unhealthy because I, I see a lot in our culture where, and, and I could see the danger of not making your plans when you're in a prayerful state, rational mind state, and then it can lead to anorexia, bulimia, you know, lot, lots of increased disordered eating. And so I love your emphasis on like what is healthy, what is rational and, and bringing God and, and his truth into that. And throughout your book, really, you talk a lot about just false thought patterns that help us to remain stuck. And you just mentioned one, right? Like I, I should be able to eat what I want when I want. And then you and you explain why that's not always helpful. But you wrote on page 17, it's not the situations that make us overeat. It's our habit of using food as a coping mechanism. And so kind of unpack, like what are some of the, and I don't think you go through them all because your book actually out, lays out a lot of lies that we can fall trapped to, but maybe to give us one more example and then also how this looks like where we may be focused on the eating, but that's not really the issue. Hey, Harker Heights, there's a new 7-Eleven in town. Now open at 307 East FM 2410 Road. Find all your favorites like Big Bite Hot Dogs, Pizza, Taquitos, Big Gulps, and Slurpees. Everything you need to get back on the go. Check out what's new with coffee from 7-Eleven. And be sure to grab one of our delicious fresh bakery items like a cookie or muffin. Visit the new 7-Eleven now open at 307 East FM 2410 Road. And download the 7 Rewards app to score free food and drinks. Hey there, it's Nicole Yunus, host of the How to Study the Bible podcast, where every single week we join together to encounter God through His Word. You can subscribe at lifeaudio.com. Right. Well, I think no matter, you know, what the trial was in life, I felt like eating for it. And so I might say things to myself like, my life is so terrible, I deserve a treat. Or this will make me feel better. Or I've already blown it today. I might as well eat more. So I'd say all these things to, to myself that people who don't struggle with eating are not saying. They're just going through life. And, and, but a lot of times they'll have different coping techniques. So I feel like everybody has something we can't control. And uh, ours just happens to be food. And in some ways that's kind of nice since it's not socially acceptable. We're, we're more prone to want to work on it, but. It, yeah, I do think it's it's not really the situations. It's not necessarily the situations of life that make us eat. They they give us the desire to eat. And then because of what we believe about the food or about life, we go ahead and eat, whereas other people will do other things. They might shop or they might, you know, binge on Netflix or do something else, if that makes any sense. Absolutely. Well, I think I do think, though, you said in some ways it's it's good because it's not so socially acceptable. But I think it's more challenging because... So like, let's say your coping mechanism is drugs and alcohol. You just don't do it at all. Like you just stay away from it and you can't say, oh, I'm just going to quit eating. So in in some ways, it seems like it's a, a more challenging battle. I would say it's more challenging, although the effects aren't so bad. You know, alcohol and drugs can ruin your life faster than food. But I do think it's more challenging. I think the trick is alcoholics say not one drink and foodaholics or emotional eaters. We have to say not one bite outside of our boundaries. So not even one bite. 
And, and one of the lies we believe is it's just one bite. Well, the truth is not, it's not just one bite because as soon as I have one bite outside my boundaries, I feel like a failure. And that makes me start thinking, oh, I've already blown it anyway. I might as well eat more. And that leads to, I'll never get over this or I'm so bad or, you know, all those self-defeating thoughts. So I think, I think that's how we deal with it. We could also, some people will say no sugar or no potato chips. So if, if a certain type of food makes you binge, some people will treat that like alcohol and just don't totally eliminate that from their life. And that decreases the craving. So people will handle those different ways or they might say, okay, I'm never going to have sweets at home. I'll only have them on social occasions. So you can kind of switch up your boundaries, but whatever bars you have, you have to approach it like the, the drug addict or alcoholic. You follow those boundaries exactly. And a lot of people will say, oh, that's just so, you know, you're being so legalistic or, you know, <laughs> you're being too rigid, live it up. But they wouldn't say that to the alcohol. Well, the alcoholic's friends who also drink a lot might say it to the alcohol. But you have to realize that people are saying that to you. They probably don't understand what you're going through and just don't listen to them. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I wonder, you know, I'm listening to you and for, and you do actually discuss this in your book for those who maybe those types of boundaries don't work. Like let's say they have a history of anorexia or bulimia where control is a big part of their disordered emotional eating. So then could they maybe say, when I feel emotional, I'm going to go for a walk or when I feel overwhelmed, I'm going to color or so to shift it from, would that be helpful? Or what would you say to those who? I I think for people who struggle with uh you know, anorexia, you'd have to make the boundaries that I eat three meals a day, even if I don't feel like it. So you, so you'd have to make your boundaries to eat a certain amount. So you eat enough and you'd have to renew your mind about the lies that you would believe as an anorexic. So you might say, I'm, I'm fat or, you know, you know, different things. Or if I, I just, you know, if I'm skinny, people, blah, blah. So you, you have to renew your mind about different lies. But I, I still think, you know, practical things like you suggested, going for a walk, all those things are super helpful. But I think we also need to, you know, take off, you know, renew our minds, like stop, see life from a, a biblical perspective. Because when see, we see life from a, a cultural perspective. So if I think I have to be married to a soulmate to be happy, or I have to be able to have this great life to be happy, or I have to finish my to-do list to be happy. When we're, we're living for those things, life doesn't always cooperate. And if we're thinking that's what we have to do to be happy, whenever we're, it doesn't meet up to our standards, we're going to do something like eat. So we kind of have to work on that whole life level. And then we also have to work in the food level. So mm-hmm. like if I were to throw up, if I'm a dealing with, a, you know, with the, that disorder, then every time I went in and threw up, I would renew my mind afterwards. So I like I have 100 renewing exercises in this book. So it makes it really easy for people to to renew their mind. Don't have any, you know, just for purging, but you'd have to kind of change the way you think. It's more important to change the way you think than the way you eat because the way we think drives everything. So our thoughts drive our desires, which drive our actions. So a lot of times we don't feel like we have the self-control to change our actions. I never did. I wanted to eat too much. I also can't change my desires. I want that food. So if I'm going to make change, I have to go back here and change at the thought level. And granted, if I get to the point where I can change my actions, it's going to kind of set a good cycle going. So that's going to give me good desires. But I still think the point of change is in the thoughts. That's what has to change for us to have change in the actions. Yeah. And I did love that about your book. And I would probably say, you know, just thinking of for those who, if they do battle bulimia, maybe for them would be, I'm not going to eat alone. Because they, you know, most most binge eaters tend to to do that in privacy. So you also talked about, which I I really loved your emphasis on. So this this was on page seventeen in your book, and you talked about sacrificing our long term transformation and freedom for immediate and and temporary, and I would suggest partial comfort, and then instead focusing on those things that truly hear our soul. That that can be painful, can't it? Yes, I'd say it's painful. It's painful because then you have to start working through the problems in your life. One of the things I talk about in the book is um, when I was going through a period in my marriage where I was super unhappy. And that led to a lots of emotional eating. But it also led to me never working on changing my marriage or my thoughts about my husband. So when I started renewing my mind about our relationship, yeah, that was painful. 
but it led to so much change. I started truth journaling every time I was annoyed with my husband. And in two months, I had a completely different attitude towards him. So it would have been easier to go to the fridge and just eat. But it by by taking the hard work, which involved a lot of tears, I renewed my mind about the relationship. I had long-term growth and we have been very 40 years and have a really great relationship. So I, I think the long-term growth is worth it, even though it's a little bit harder and painful. <laughs> yeah. And so basically by doing that growth, even though it took much more time than turning to a brownie in the moment, every time you got annoyed. So it's, it's like you lifted this major source of anxiety and negative emotions, and you just completely, with God's help, removed that from your life. I mean, not, I'm sure you guys still have issues, but is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah. And the funny thing was, I did that before I ever really started uh, renewing my mind about food. And I, I kind of realized I probably had about a five pounds worth of anger in me. So <laughs> I lost that five pounds <laughs> and renewing my mind about my husband. And I didn't gain that back, even though I wasn't at the point yet where I'd really renewed a lot about food and that behavior and broken free from the control of food, which so I thought that was kind of funny. That reminds me, God's heart is for our freedom and our restoration and, and our shalom, which is wholeness in every area of our life. So I, I love how you focus on like, when we when we grow in one area, it kind of pretty soon we grow in this area and then we grow in this area. So it's all interconnected. You also speaking of your husband and your you, you said annoyances and your anger and your, your five pound like you just said five pound anger. So I found it interesting that you discussed the impact you're maintaining a critical spirit had on you and your emotions. I would love you to expand on that because I don't know if we all often think about that. Like where we think of our anxiety, but we don't all often think about the bitterness, the the anger, the resentment, the critical. So how does that really affect our battle in this area or in any area as we pursue freedom? Well, I was the type of person who who looked for and that is not that I look for the worst in people, but I noticed it, especially in my husband. And so instead of looking at all the things that were good about him and his strengths, I noticed the things that were bad. And I was also like that in life. And so if we're people who are always noticing the bad in people, other people, we're going to be annoyed with them. If we're always noticing the bad things in life, we're either going to be discontent, depressed, maybe jealous of others who seem to have a better life. Or, or we might be worried because we're also going to be seeing the bad in the future. Like I was a pursuer. It's like worst case scenario for future. That's what I always imagined. And, and that's something I'm still working on. I definitely haven't gotten over that. But then that leads to the worry, the fear, the anxiety. And so by, by working on that one little quality, you know, I'm going to start, you know, focusing on Thanksgiving. I'm going to start maybe three times a day. I'm going to write down three things I'm thankful for or. Or dwelling on the good in people, then that can help lead to less negative emotions, less fear, less anxiety, less annoyance, <laughs> and and more peace and joy. You just live more in in a good life because you're focusing on the good. And joy really increases our resiliency, and and in itself helps us fight anxiety. I went as I'm listening. I think we may not be aware of some of us have learned to be critical, and so I think it can be helpful to look at like our family of origins and was yeah. there an attitude of, of, you know, a critical nature that we want to break free from. And so recognizing that I think can really help us to experience freedom as well. So you've shared a couple lies. So I want to do what I, I, I should be able to do what I want. This will make me feel better. Do you have any, was there any other like particularly enslaving lives that you felt like this is really big? Uh, I'd probably say this is so good. I should have another piece. So I might think the more the better, right? Or let's see, was that because you think that was because you thought, well, if I don't have it now, I'll never have it. Or like, did, was there any sense of, did it ever help think, well, I can have this tomorrow or I can have another piece next no, week? No, not really. No. no. It's okay. just that, hey, if life is fun doing one thing, why not do more of it? Right. Gotcha. gotcha. <laughs> Although my kids, funnily enough, because we have four kids and they have kind of grew up thinking, hey, I'd better get it now or somebody else is going to get it. <laughs> so that was my, <laughs> when I, the, the day, but you know, I was the adult, so I, I had as much as I wanted. So yeah, I think the more is better. Oh, my life will be so boring if I don't mm. fun things. That was a big one. I equated food with fun and excitement. That's our culture, right? So much of what we do is centers around food. And so as I'm listening to you right now, I, I wonder if it could be helpful if we struggle with food or whatever our, our coping mechanism is, 
if we start finding alternative ways to experience joy. So I also love what you wrote on page 22. When we've lived with lies for so many years, it can take a lot of truth to get those lies out of our system. I'm going to I'm going to repeat this actually again, because I really want our listeners to recognize today. And this is speaking of myself. I often don't recognize the long term journey, just how long this journey of transformation with Christ of, of experience freedom is. And I will think, well, OK, I tried this. I maybe even tried this for six months and it didn't work. Therefore, it's not working for me. And I'm going to I'm going to quit. So I want to read this quote again because I really, really loved it. When we've lived with lies for so many years, it can take a lot of truth to get those lies out of our system. So tell us a little about what that looked like for you. You did say so it's been 20 years, right? 20. A, tw- a 20 year journey for you. Oh, well, no, probably. I mean, I've been free for 13 years and it was probably just a couple of years I was working on it. But in the beginning, I wasn't working on it. I was just kind of going on and off. So basically, I talk in the book about something called truth drilling, where you're writing down, what am I believing that's making me want to eat? So you have, you know, five beliefs and then you look at each belief and you say, is it true? And then you write the truth down. And so every day I'd be believing the same thing. So you think, OK, I just have to write. Let's say the belief is, you know, I should have another one because, you know, more is better. OK, write the truth down. OK, I'm not done with that lie for forever. It's like the next day I'll be believing the same thing. So you keep truth drilling the same lies over and over again until you're you're sick to death of them. You're like, oh, I can't believe this is coming up again. And you just have to persevere and then keep truth drilling those. And what happens is in the beginning, all you hear is the lie. Actually, in the beginning, you don't even know it's a lie. It looks like truth. So in the beginning, you don't even know it's a lie. It looks like truth. And then after you truth drill a bunch of times, you'll hear the lie and you'll hear the truth at the same time. And then eventually you won't hear the lie anymore. All you'll hear is the truth. So you get to the like the ridiculous truth level. So I'm at the ridiculous truth level with binging. Binging used to be a regular thing for me. Now I it wouldn't even I wouldn't even want to binge. There'd be absolutely no reason I'd ever even consider binging. So that's not even a fight anymore. So that's that's kind of kind of what happens as you truth journal. But it it takes a lot of work. But a lot of times people won't want to do it. That's actually why I wrote this book because a lot of people say, yeah, I know the renewing the mind will change me, but they can't make themselves do it. So I wrote this book with the 100 renewing exercises to make it easy to renew your mind. And people have been writing me to tell me, yeah, it's been helping. But what what I've noticed is when you renew your mind, it takes less than five minutes. It doesn't take very long. I mean, a lot of times it might take three or four minutes. So if you renew your mind like three times a day, you know, that's no more than 15 minutes. And think of what do we do for 15 minutes each day? So so that's another lie we believe that's going to take so much work. But in, in reality... Yeah, it takes a lot of work. That's true. But it doesn't take that much time each day. And so they'd be like doing Duolingo language. You know, you don't spend that much time each day, but over the course of like teaching, you know, absolutely learning the language. Yeah. I'm thinking of Dr. Neil T. Anderson. He has this the Steps of Freedom program and he talks about he actually leads you through where he says, I renounce the lie. And I may be using the wrong wording, but I renounce the lie that this brownie is going to alleviate my anxiety. I announce the truth that peace is found in Christ, whatever you you. And I really like how he guides you to actually speak it Mm -hmm. out. Do you do that ever? I haven't, but I think that's great. I really like Neil Anderson. I actually interviewed him for the Christian Habits podcast a couple of years ago, but I, I just haven't write it down. I tell everybody, make sure you write it down, write down the belief, write down the truth right next to it. I, I think speaking might be maybe it's the same as writing but when you just keep it in your mind it doesn't seem to be quite as impactful that's a good point yeah so yeah. because this is this is a a faith over fear podcast where we're progressively we're all progressively seeking increased freedom tell us where you're at now you've you've shared a bit like with your binge eating and praise god did you ever think that was possible no before? i never thought it'd be possible i thought i'd be living my whole life with it <laughs> yeah yeah and so talk to me about has shame lifted as that that behavior lifted? Do you feel have you sensed a, a shame lifting? Yeah, I guess so. I you know I don't know if I really maybe I I did have the shame thing going on in high school. I am sure I did. I renew my mind a lot about body image, and that was pretty easy to get over. So that as soon as I you know got a biblical perspective on body image, then the shame lifted. So it's like that was one journey, which was the body image. Then the other journey was the food. 
but I've also, you know, applied it to other things in life. And so, you know, I used to be living in a state of anxiety, resentment, probably, you know, let, let's just say if it was a, a hundred percent of the day, I don't think it was a hundred percent of the day, but a good amount. I mean, it probably wasn't, probably was like 70% of the day. But after I worked through the things in my marriage, that, that was probably the main thing. I, I was living in peace and joy for 95% of the day. Wow. Which, which, which was a, a huge percent of the day. But then I started writing and I writing brought up all my anxieties Uh-oh. and fears. And plus I didn't like writing. So I had a really procrastination. Problem. <laughs> yeah. So then I, I went back up to living in stress again. No, no more was I living in peace and joy 95%. So it's like a new trial to work through. And then it kind of got to the point where I've made a lot of progress in that. And now I have a new trial with our new lifestyle now nearing retirement. So it's like the, you know, preparing for retirement that can also give more anxiety and fear. So I feel like with each trial in your life, it's like you have to learn the way to walk through it with God to where you're kind of holding the outcome in open hands. You're like, okay, I can see even if I don't get my want, life can still be good, make life about God. And you kind of learn the path to peace and joy in that trial, if that makes sense. Yeah, I love how you're focusing it on Christ and just in anything we face. Just I think it's helpful if we remember that whatever we're facing, we are more than conquerors in Jesus Christ because we are amply supplied by him. We, he gives us everything we need to live a thriving life. And, and he's a healer who is compassionate for our wounds, our struggles, and whose desire, his heart and his desire is for us. And this book, I, again, to our listeners, whether you struggle from emotional eating or not, she really, the things she leads you through can be a a very healing, transformative journey. It definitely, I can see it would be helpful for those who struggle with emotional eating. But Barb, I think it's just a great tool for any time we find our emotions kind of leading our life rather than our plan. So I really appreciate, I want to actually, the title of the book again is Say Goodbye to Emotional Eating, 100 Renewing Exercises to Help You Break Free from the Control of Food. It's a great resource. Barb, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's good to be here. So to our listeners, I hope you've gained some encouragement and maybe some insights that you can move forward in your day as you seek out your own freedom. I encourage you to check out our book, check out our website. You have a lot of books actually available. I saw on on, on your website. So she's got a lot of resources that you will find extremely helpful. If you haven't already done so, I encourage you to subscribe to this podcast. Then you won't miss a single episode and make sure to rate it. That helps others to find it and encourages our team as well. Until next time, may you live as one who truly has been set free. Faith Over Fear is a production of Life Audio and Salem Media. If you liked what you heard today, please take a second to rate and review this podcast in your favorite podcast app so that more listeners like you can find the show. For more faith-filled, inspirational podcasts, visit us at lifeaudio.com. Hey, Harker Heights, there's a new 7-Eleven in town, now open at 307 East FM 2410 Road. Find all your favorites like Big Bite Hot Dogs, Pizza, Taquitos, Big Gulps, and Slurpees. Everything you need to get back on the go. Check out what's new with coffee from 7-Eleven, and be sure to grab one of our delicious fresh bakery items like a cookie or muffin. Visit the new 7-Eleven now open at 307 East FM 2410 Road, and download the 7 Rewards app to score free food and drinks.